Welcome to On The Level, broadcasting from the Blue Ocean Network studios here in Beijing. My name is Fergus Thompson. Now, China's environmental challenges are no secret. Uh, images of cities swathed in smog, dead fish floating in eerily colored rivers, and reports of crops growing in poison soil have become almost cliches. But for years, the authorities brushed away complaints while pushing for ever higher GDP growth. Recently, though, it seems there have been signs of change. The government has obliged thousands of factories and other emitters to publish emissions data in real time. A plan of action to reduce pollution was issued last year, and a new, tougher environmental law comes into force next year. But will plans, laws and regulations translate into real action? Well, to discuss China's environmental woes, whether a corner has been turned and what role NGOs have in that process, I'm delighted to be joined today by Matthew Collins. Uh, Matthew is a project manager at one of China's premier environmental groups, the Institute for Public and Environmental Affairs. Matthew Collins, welcome to On the Level. Thank you very much for having me. Um, Matthew, first of all, from outside, we see a very bleak picture in the media whenever China and the environment are mentioned. Is that unfair? Is it up to date? Is it as bad as all that? Um, the situation in China at the moment is incredibly serious. Mm -hmm. I mean, as you mentioned in your introduction there, the past kind of 30 years, the Chinese government has very much uh, put GDP growth at the forefront of, um, of their projects. And this has resulted in uh, huge changes in China. There's been massive industrialization over the past 30 years. Um, and it's brought uh, you know, um, big changes, but also uh, many advantages for Chinese people. So mm -hmm. millions of people have been dragged out of poverty. Um, there's been a huge increase in, in general wealth. But this has also brought uh, many problems. And environmental problems is, is one of those problems. Um, and we see these issues with air pollution. Mm -hmm. um, living in Beijing, you know, we quite often experience very serious periods of smog. But there are also issues around water as well. Something like 300 million uh, rural residents in China still don't have access to safe drinking water. Um, we see issues around soil pollution as well. Um, the Chinese government estimates that about 12 million tons of grain are contaminated with heavy metals every year. And the issues around water pollution and soil pollution are maybe, uh, they're not as focused on as, as air pollution has been. I think the reason with air pollution is so visual. So, you know, you can step out of your door or look out the window in Beijing and you can see how bad it is mm -hmm. on days when it's really bad. So people can, can see it. And whereas water is maybe not as reported on as the air pollution problem, but is, is equally serious. Mm -hmm. and, and soil pollution as well. Um, another reason why air is, has kind of come to the forefront is because we've just had so much more access to information on air quality. And this has increased massively over the past couple of years, um, much more so than we have information on water quality or soil quality, uh, water quality more so than soil quality. Mm -hmm. Well, root causes for this, you've mentioned the economy. What about attitudes? Do, do people or did people in the past simply not care too much about it? I think in the past, the attitude to the environment was maybe, uh, you know, sidelined a little bit. It was kind of, we need to increase our GDP figures. Um, industry is more important. So if the environment maybe gets damaged during the process, then, you know, we'll ignore it for now. Mm -hmm. We can work on that later. But this was not, not only official uh, policy, if you like, or, or attitudes, but you're talking about the general public here as well. Yeah, and I think the awareness of how serious the situation was as well um, was, was not there. And that's kind of come about in the last kind of 10 or 20 years that people have really started to pay more attention to it, partly because they, they, they've managed to get hold of the information or mm -hmm. the, the data that explains how, how serious the situation is. The organization that, that you work for, the Institute for Public and Environmental Affairs, is, is actually heavily involved in providing that information. Maybe you could just give us a sort of a, a rundown, a, a brief rundown of what your organization actually does. What are its goals and what, what are its methods? I mean, uh, the Institute of Public Environmental Affairs, or IP as we call it, um, was formed in 2006 by our director, uh, Ma Jun. Mm -hmm. And prior to forming the organization, he'd been working as a reporter for the, the South China Morning Post. And he'd been reporting a lot on uh, environmental issues. And he started to, you know, traveling around China and seeing that how serious some of these issues were. And seeing that people didn't have access to, you know, information about how serious the problem was. And prior to the IP being formed in 2006, the Chinese government enacted a number of kind of uh, laws and regulations, which meant that more information was coming into the public domain. So more information about environmental issues. Uh, and the idea of the IPE was to, you know, how can we grab this data? How can we use this data that the government is releasing and turn it into a form that is more easily accessible for the public? Um, 
uh, sometimes the data is released by the Chinese government in a way that it's quite hard to find it. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily in a format which is easy to understand. So the idea was to, to take all this data from all over the country, from different places, and, and to, to use it you know, to effect real change. So this data is saying how much pollution there is, whether it's water, air or soil, and who's emitting it, presumably. Yeah, so the, the data that, that uh, we started collecting, um, some of it was to do with uh, water quality, air quality, but there was also another set of data as well, which was being released by the, the Chinese government. And this was uh, information on local uh, polluters. So if they were breaching uh, environmental regulations, so if they were discharging above the legal uh, discharge standard, for instance, mm -hmm. or we see them discharging through secret uh, wastewater pipes, or maybe they built wastewater treatment systems, but they just weren't using it, and the local government had given them some kind of penalty for this, uh, they would then release this information to the public on their local Environmental Protection Bureau website or uh, so through local media as well mm -hmm. sometimes. But again, this was in a way that was quite difficult for, for people to get hold of it. It was released kind of sporadically. Mm -hmm. So you've got lots of different provinces in China with different, uh, even lower level kind of uh, environmental uh, authorities releasing this information. So it was hard for people to get hold of. So at IPE, we started to take this information and, and put it into one central location, which is what we call the, the pollution map databases. And when IPE started in 2006, in the, uh, the first year, there were about 3,000 of these supervision records for local uh, polluters. And, and now in total, we have uh, over 160,000 records in the database. So th just the, the, the level of information, the level of data that is becoming available has increased massively over the past eight years. So you're essentially, you're taking all this data, you're making it more accessible to the public and you're letting people know you can find this. Uh, what, what can they then do about it what, when they see this data? What does it mean to the ordinary member of the public here? Um, I think for the ordinary member of the public, it, it's, it's still, you know, it needs to be uh, changed and, and, and interpreted as well. And one of the things that we thought about was how can we use this data? You know, how, we, we've got this incredible source there, mm -hmm. but what can we use it for? And we started to look through the data as well. And you could see that some of these companies in there, they were the, the same company and they were having repeat violations. So maybe five years in a row, they had the, the same problem the same issue. So they were maybe paying a very small fine to the local government because they were discharging uh, wastewater that was breaching the, the, the discharge standard. But it didn't actually change their behavior. It was, it was more like uh, some of them see it as a kind of tax. Right. You know, so you just pay the fine. Uh -huh. So the cost of, of, of compliance is actually higher than the cost of violation. Mm -hmm. So to change that behavior, we were thinking, you know, what is the real, the real obstacle? And if you look at the situation, there is, um, the technology is available to, to you know, uh, build these kind of wastewater or air emissions treatment kind of facilities. It exists. You can see it in, in, in other countries where mm -hmm. they use this, even in China and other places where they use it. But it just wasn't being used in, in, for these polluting factories. And there's a lot of money available for these kind of technology as well. I mean, China over the past 30 years has become, you know, uh, a very advanced kind of economy and very developed. So there's money available as well, but there's absolutely no motivation for these companies to actually change. So the idea was how can we take this information and this data and motivate these companies to change? And, and that's when uh, an organization called the Green Choice Alliance was formed. And this is a, a coalition of NGOs. Um, at the time, it was 21 NGOs based all across China. Grassroots NGOs who are interested in industrial pollution problems in a similar way that IPE is. Mm -hmm. And uh, the aim was that these NGOs would come together and call collectively on uh, multinational companies, on companies, uh, large companies, uh, not to source from polluting suppliers. And so, uh, you know, we have this resource here, this database of all these supervision records. How can these multinational companies uh, identify the, the problems within their supply chain in China and start to address some of these issues? So, the multi, so you're, putting, you're, you're saying to the multinational companies, OK, you've got no excuse now. You know if some of your suppliers are breaching the rules. Uh, we've got the data here. Why don't you take a look at it and perhaps then put pressure on your suppliers. Yeah, that's right. So um, there are a couple of companies that we started to deal with initially. So in 2007 onwards, there are a couple of individual companies. So companies like GE, Nike, uh, Walmart as well, Unilever. Uh, they saw this resource as incredibly useful to, mm -hmm. to understand what's going on in their supply chain in China. So they started to do regular comparisons of the IP database and their list of suppliers in China. Mm -hmm. um, prior to this, these companies were saying, you know, we, we 
don't know where to get hold of this information. Right. We can't understand if our suppliers are in compliance with the regulations or not. It's very hard to, to get hold of this data. So did, did most of these multinationals come on board? Did you have any problems? Were, were people reluctant in some cases? Um, and if so, what could you do about it? Initially, you know, we were dealing with individual companies and, and they were quite interested. They're the kind of more active kind of companies who want to learn about their supply chain. And from a, from a business perspective, mm -hmm. the, the forward looking ones, you know, started to do this. But there were quite a few who, who didn't want to use this kind of information. And we were just looking at individual companies in the past. But then in 2010, we started to notice a number of kind of uh, heavy metal pollutant uh, incidents in China, across China. Mm -hmm. And looking through the database of the kind of companies that had these kind of violation problems, it became apparent that a lot of them were from the electronics industry. Uh, and these were companies manufacturing mobile phones, computers, televisions, these kind of things. And by looking at the, and pulling out all the records that we had in the database, we could then see, you know, uh, you've got something like 4,000 of these electronics uh, manufacturers in China. Mm -hmm. And then trying to find a connection between these electronics manufacturers in China and multinational companies who are purchasing from them. And, and the idea was to um, find a connection between these two companies and then approach the, the multinational companies and say to them, you know, um, did you realize that this supplier had these issues? And, um, you know, if you, if you did know about it, what, what has your supplier done to, to correct these issues? You know, all these uh, multinational companies, many of them have uh, a supplier code of conduct. And they quite often say, you know, that suppliers have to be in compliance with local laws and re uh, regulations. Mm -hmm. So if you're telling them, oh, you know, we think this is your supplier and it, it, it's not in compliance, then, you know, the, some of them are very interested in this kind of information and how they can, you know, work with their suppliers. So overall, has this been a success, do you feel, with these multinational companies? Um, it's... Uh, in some of them, it's been a success. So with the electronics industry, um, we approached 33 companies. And, and there was one company initially that didn't respond to us, and that was Apple. And uh, they said that we, we do not discuss kind of uh, supply chain issues mm -hmm. with outside parties. Mm -hmm. And, and we, we started to see more and more issues with Apple's supply chain in China and realized that they actually had some quite serious problems within, within their suppliers. And so we looked specifically at Apple as a kind of case study. And um, first of all, we, we did a report and we looked and we detailed some of these suppliers and the issues they had. And we explained this uh, in the report. And this kind of picked up in the media as well. Through this kind of process, um, there was pressure kind of mounting on Apple to deal with these issues. And even after the release of the first report, um, Apple still refused to respond to us. Mm -hmm. and, and there were times where I thought, um, you know, maybe this, uh, maybe this company is just going to completely point blank refuse to respond to any of these issues. But then on the, on the morning of the release of uh, our second report looking specifically at Apple, they actually contacted us and said, you know, we need to start uh, discussing some of these issues. Right. And then following that, there was kind of a, a lengthy period of negotiation uh, backwards and forwards between Apple and IPE and all the other, uh, some of the other NGOs in the, in the Green Choice Alliance as well. And one of the, the big success stories of this is that Apple has actually gone from being one of the worst performing companies that we dealt with to being one of the most active and best performing companies. Right. They've, it's <laughs> success a success story. Yeah, the turnaround has been quite incredible. Right. What about the, the level of public awareness here? Now, the the uh, IP was started back in 2006, 2014. There is a lot more public awareness in China amongst Chinese people of pollution about these, uh, whether it's companies or, or power stations. Why do you think there has been that change in awareness? Where has that come from? I think there's a couple of reasons why this has, has happened. Um, one of the reasons is, is technology. Um, so there's been the birth of kind of social media, which has played quite a big part in uh, the dissemination of this information. Uh, the other thing is the Chinese government has started to release more, more information as well. And I think uh, the Chinese public, you know, getting kind of sick of the, the problem as well. So we saw in the run-up to the Olympics there was quite a big thing about, you know, the environment. And then we saw during the Olympics the environment was, was, was okay, you know. And I think people saw that, you know, you can start to, you know, address these issues. And another kind of factor was the, the U.S. Embassy. They had uh, their own um, tweeting of the, the PM 2.5 level, so the very, very small particulate matter level. Right, this is when they were actually putting out the figures uh, and they were different to the, to the Beijing government figures because they were using different systems, but people were 
following the U.S. embassy's uh, ratings and basing their daily life decisions on them. Yeah, so the, the Chinese government at the time were releasing information for slightly larger particulate matter. Mm -hmm. And the very, very small particulate matter is, is, is more dangerous. It can go further into your lungs and mm -hmm. it can actually get into your bloodstream. So um, the Chinese government was only reporting on the, the largest kind of size, whereas the, the U.S. embassy was reporting on the, the PM2.5. And uh, they were also doing it in real time as well. And the, lots of uh, Weibo users, so this is the Chinese version of Twitter, mm -hmm. they started to take this information and then retweeting it. And uh, you know, there was this kind of snowballing effect. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just social media either. Traditional media was starting to report on these issues as well. Mm -hmm. And then we had that really particularly bad kind of bout of smog in Beijing. And uh, you know, it's come to the point now where you know, the, the Chinese news is now reporting on uh, this as well. Right. So it's, become very much a mainstream kind of issue. I mentioned there in the introduction that do seem to be signs of change at the official level as well, that we have these new initiatives regarding a plan for pollution, um, a, a new environmental law, we'll talk about that shortly, but do you think that's a reflection of the government responding to this increased pressure from the public? I think so, yeah. I think this, this kind of pressure from the public and this idea that the public participating in this kind of governance mm -hmm. has really uh, put pressure on, on the government to, you know, to start monitoring PM2.5, uh, monitoring the, the small particulate matter and releasing this information to the public as well. So we saw them start to do this in Beijing. And uh, people could go on there and access this information and see exactly how bad the smog was. In the past, I mean, you could see it, but you didn't have the data to back up, you know, official government data to back up how serious the situation mm -hmm. was. Um, so it's been a, a, you know, a process which has happened, and it's happened quite quickly as well, just over yeah. the past couple of years. There is, uh, coming up next year, a new environmental law uh, w will be issued. Um, Give us a brief rundown. Is it much tougher than what went before? Is it, is it serious about raising fines and making sure that people comply? Um, there are certain aspects within, within this law which are, which are much tougher, yeah. Um, there are several points that are definitely worth noting. Um, one of them I mentioned earlier, the, the fines. So the, some polluters are just taking these, these nominal fines as kind of a taxation, mm -hmm. paying it one year. Uh, and then the following year, they, they'll still pay it because the, the fines were capped at a fairly low level. Right. So the big difference with this, uh, the, the, the amendment to the law, means that the fine will increase on a daily basis as long as the, the company continues to pollute. So you, you have a, a very strong incentive there uh, to make sure that they, they, they stop polluting. So that's one, one big change there. Yeah. And I think uh, you mentioned that the, the enforcement problem. One of the other exciting things uh, in this new regulation is the whole section on uh, information disclosure and public participation. Um, if it's difficult to enforce these regulations, if there are local interests which may be preventing them from being enforced properly, uh, one area that we've seen a massive uh, expansion in is, is the, the amount of information that's becoming available. Mm -hmm. We've seen that at IPE over the past eight years, just the, the amount of data that we've been able to collect. Uh, and this trend doesn't seem like it's, it's stopping anytime soon. It looks like it's going to increase, in fact. And this new section in the environmental protection law is, is very important for us, the work we do at IPE. And I think this is going to allow people to play a, a bigger role. So it's going to allow NGOs uh, and the public in general to play a bigger role in kind of supervising uh, how well these laws are enforced. You issued one report, a Blue Sky report, in which you identified uh, polluting emitters around the country several thousand of these. Now, last year, interestingly, the government itself obliged uh, something like 15,000 emitters, factories or power plants or whatever, to provide real-time data of what pollution uh, they are sending out. Does this also send a good signal? Because some of these, uh, or many of these organizations, are not the multinationals or the, or the suppliers of or consumer goods but actually state-owned enterprises, which is always, have always been seen as somewhat protected either by central or local government. Yeah, this is an incredibly powerful signal, I think, to, to try and tackle some of these really big emitters. So this list that the Chinese government releases of uh, around 15,000 of these big emitters, mm -hmm. they actually uh, are responsible for about 65% of China's total emissions. So if you consider the, the hundreds of thousands of factories in China, mm -hmm. and then this 15,000 are responsible for such a high percentage of these emissions. So these are, what sort of industries are we talking about? So we're talking about power generation, we're talking about steel factories, um, cement factories. Mm -hmm. um, there are some big kind of consumer product factories in there, so things like printed circuit boards that go into mobile phones, uh, with some of the big dye houses that, uh, that 
sell their fabric to some of these consumer okay. brands mm -hmm. will also be included because they have such huge volumes of wastewater discharge. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it includes some of those, as you say, the big state-owned enterprises. So just run us through the process. What happens? These, these factories have to somehow measure this data and send it off somewhere, and, and somehow you get it. How, how does that chain work? So the Chinese government has invested a huge amount of money in these kind of automatic monitoring systems. And what happens is that the, the, the factory in question has to uh, install, or the local environmental protection bureau installs this uh, monitoring system at, the, at these factories. And this information is fed automatically. So every hour for some air uh, pollutants and every two hours for some uh, wastewater pollutants. And it's fed directly from the factory itself automatically to uh, the provincial environmental protection bureau. So it comes automatically from uh, these factories, from the power plants, from the steel mills, from all their different outlets. And it comes to the provincial environmental protection bureau who then release this information to the public. And they do this in, in different kind of ways. So the, the MEP, the Ministry of Environmental Protection, mm -hmm. said to them, you need to create these platforms. And so they've all created slightly different platforms. Yeah. And doesn't make things easy. <laughs> no, it doesn't make things easy. And some of them are much better than other ones. Right. So some of them provide a lot more detailed information than other ones. Um, and what we're doing at IP is actually grabbing the information that the, uh, the provincial environmental protection bureaus are releasing to the public. And we're taking that information and putting it into a format which is much easier to understand. Mm. Right, so you're putting that information out which is telling people which emitters are exceeding the levels by what they are exceeding and so on. Uh, and then you, you actually put together a report earlier this year uh, naming those uh, companies or those emitters that were doing it. Uh, how, how did that go down? How was, how was it received? I think the, the response was, was pretty good. You know, uh, many of these, these companies were emitting way above way in breach of, of the, the legal standard. And we were trying to highlight the fact that this information was now available. So you could go on there and you could see for every hour that, that you know, some of the companies were really, really breaching these standards. And the idea was to, you know, to make this uh, information more widely available mm -hmm. and to kind of test the water and see uh, what the response was from some of these companies and also from uh, you know, government departments as well and see um, what the response was. But, one of the things is we're taking official government data and using this information uh, to making it more user friendly. So we're not creating new data. So we're just taking official data. So how easy it is for somebody then to, to, to go to their phone and check out what's happening nearby at a factory that they see in their locality? Yeah, so that's one thing that we decided to do with this data, was to take it and turn it into uh, something that people can really easily get hold of. And so we created the, the Pollution Map app. So this is an app for Android and for iPhone, for smartphone users to be able to go on there. And the app, um, first of all, you, you come into a page and it identifies your location. And you can see air quality information for the location. Right. So you can see how bad you know, the, the different pollutants, the levels of different pollutants are in your area. And then you can scroll across onto an interactive map. So on this interactive map, we're taking the information uh, from you know, these provincial environmental protection bureaus mm -hmm and plotting it on a map, the location of these factories. And you can click on them, there's a big red circle there, if they're breaching the, uh, the discharge standards. Right. And you can click on it and it will tell you the, the level that they're discharging at. And it also tell you the, the legal standard as well. So you can see which factories in your area are discharging beyond the, the, the legal standard. Have you had any pushback? Because some of these uh, SOEs, state-owned enterprises as they're called, have very powerful local interests and uh, uh, vested interests indeed. Um, are you, does this worry you at all? Um, I, the responses we've had have been fairly positive. Um, you know, people have been taking this information and again retweeting it on Weibo and uh, asking for responses from these companies. And mm -hmm. some of them have responded, some big you know, SREs have responded saying, you know, we are, we are trying to work on this issue. So it's actually bringing it to their attention. So I'd say it's been a positive response. Right. In the, uh, you seem to rely a lot on, on technology, information technology, to do the work you're doing because you're not a huge organisation, but you're dealing with huge amounts of, of data. Um, is this something that the IP sees as sort of a way forward, using IT to monitor and, and talk about and eventually resolve pollution problems? Very much so. I mean, uh, 
the amount of data that we've been dealing with over the past kind of eight years has grown massively. And now with the, the advent of this kind of uh, real-time disclosure as well, means that the, the, the quantity of data that we have to deal with is huge. Mm -hmm. uh, in the past, uh, IPE, we didn't have... Um, you know, a whole IT department. You know, when I joined IP, there was only uh, nine of us, I think. Uh, but now, to deal with all this information, to deal with all this data, we've had to take on a, a whole kind of IT department. And so we have, you know, three or four colleagues who are working specifically on, on this. IPE uh, has been recognised, it's, it's received rewards for the success of the work that it's done in a relatively short time, and we're talking just from 2006, um, where many NGOs in China, whether they're foreign or Chinese, have a tough time dealing with the government. You seem to have found a way of uh, getting work done. How, what's your secret? What's the secret that you have that, that many other NGOs, uh, where they failed? I guess one of the big decisions that Majin took when he started the IPE was this idea that we would take official data. So we would take official government data and you know, use that information, not necessarily create our own data. And I think that's been kind of key to the fact that we've been allowed to operate with the space that we have. So um, we're not taking anything uh, you know, really contentious. We're taking government information and then working with it and using it for for our, our projects and, and making it more accessible to the general public. Is there any difference in the way that you might actually sort of deal with officials as an organization that might be different to, to other NGOs that perhaps they could learn from? I mean, our approach to um, dealing with uh, officials in China or official environmental authorities mm. is, is very much uh, a, a discussion with them, you know, asking them for information. But every year we do a report looking at how transparent uh, cities are across China, so the environmental authorities, how much information they're providing to the general public about how bad, how serious the pollution level is in, in their jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. And the part of the process of doing this report and this study is to contact these environmental protection bureaus and ask them for information. And this has resulted in some, you know, you know quite serious discussion with them and to the point where now uh, a relationship is built up and, you know, there's a level of trust is built up between, you know, these local environmental protection bureaus and uh, IPE. Uh, I think another thing that IPE does um, is is to be very collaboratory. So working with not just um, uh, different kind of government bureaus, you know, uh, being in communication with them, but also working with other NGOs through the Green Choice Alliance. So you know, if there's an issue, then there's at the time in 2007 there was 21 NGOs. This has grown to over 50 now. So if there's an issue there, then you know there's a whole coalition of NGOs that need to be uh, dealt with. It's not just one organisation for many of these projects. Finally, just uh, moving away from the more general picture here, I, I did mention that the IP is a Chinese organisation, a Chinese NGO. Uh, you are obviously not a, a Chinese person or a Chinese national yourself. A foreigner working for this, is this incidental and, and, and does it bring anything to the organization? Um, yeah, you're right. Uh, IPE is a, a Chinese organization. And for me, that was you know, quite appealing when I, when I joined IPE, was to, to learn about these things from a Chinese perspective, from a very Chinese perspective. I mean, international NGOs have you know, uh, very much a Chinese perspective as well. But I thought it was interesting to join a local NGO. And I think the reason why uh, having a foreigner work there is, is, is very useful is because much of the time we're dealing with uh, foreign companies as well. Mm -hmm. So with the, the green supply chain program, many of the companies that we deal with uh, are foreign companies that are sourcing within China. So it's important for us to be able to explain to them what's going on in China, not just through the language, so translating things from Chinese to English, but also translating you know, the concept mm -hmm. of how the Chinese government is dealing with these issues, uh, of how the situation is in China. And I think that's my role within IPE. A lot of the time is, is talking to not just foreign businesses, but foreign uh, government organizations as well, and uh, foreign academics as well, and explaining to them the situation in China and how a Chinese organization is dealing with that. So it's a kind of uh, translatory sort of role. Well, it certainly seems to be a key time to be involved in, in environmental issues in, in a country like China. Um, wish you the best of luck in your career in IP and for IP as well in its endeavors in reducing pollution in China. Matthew Collins, thanks for coming on the level.